tricked into marrying Leah, the oldest daughter. He was supposed to marry Rachel. Um, and then he ended up trying to have children. They couldn't have children. So the two wives gave over their handmaidens. And so they were just popping out kids and, and things were uh, not well. They lived in two different households. So they were just bumping heads, bumping heads. And finally, as we go get to Joseph, there were some events that had happened. And so two things I want to bring out before we actually jump into 37 is again to remind you guys of what happened to Dinah. Uh, that was the sister uh, or the child, the only female child of Leah who was uh, raped. And then the brothers, specifically Simeon and Levi, went and took it upon them to um, exact revenge for their sister and got the other brothers involved too and then slaughtered everybody, all the men in Shechem. And while that was going on, Reuben, the firstborn son, the rightful heir, um, does something to drop him from the firstborn to now he's not, he doesn't have those rights anymore. And what he did was he actually took his, his father's uh, handmaiden, or, or the, the wife, Billa, and slept with her. And so that was a sin, and that knocked him down from being the firstborn. Now he doesn't have those rights anymore. And so now Jacob and Esau finally meet only to, again, depart from one another and then only come back to bury father, and then they're gone. So now we find Jacob in Hebron, back where in Canaan, where he originally started, where God said that it, this would happen. So we're going to pick up in verse 2, chapter 37, verse 2. This is the history of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers, and the lad was with the sons of Bila and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children, because he was the son of his old age. Also he made him a tunic of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all the brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. So we'll pause there and just kind of talk about that. Joseph, again, this is uh, the son of Rachel. And it says that this was his, his favorite son because of his old age, but it was also his favorite son because that was the son of his favorite wife. This is the wife he initially wanted. He wanted to have children with this, this um, a married life and children with, the, with Rachel. But Leah came about and all these things happened. And so already we're seeing the dysfunction from generation to this generation. It's already starting to occur. The favoritism is coming back, just like with Jacob and his mom, that favoritism that played out. But not only that, uh, they, Jacob makes a coat to signify or mark Joseph as a leader, uh, the future leader of their family. But not only that, but he's bestowing the first rights to him the, uh, the, as the firstborn. So again, the brothers see this and they're getting upset. There's rivalries going on because this was the last born son up until this point. He has 10 other brothers, but all of a sudden, man, Joseph's a favorite one. We've been here for a while and Joseph gets all these rights and, you know, it, it just doesn't seem fair. So the, this, this anger is building up. The word for uh, tunic of many colors, I just thought it was an interesting study, is... Uh, Kutune pas. Kutune means tunic. Pas means um, of the tunic reaching the palms. So the Septuagint favors this definition because it's just saying it's a long coat um, all the way reaching his palms. So it's different from his brothers. It also says uh, many colors and that's what uh, pas means, diverse colors. Also, when you get into a study I thought was interesting is, you know, when we're younger and even when we get older, we hear the story of Joseph and the coat of many colors. Well, there's some studies that say that that coat was actually a white coat. It was so white that just like a pearl color, when the, the, the light would hit it, it would change colors. And so that was a multicolored coat. So whatever the case being, if it's a multicolored jacket or a white, solid white, or just a long tunic, he was, again, being separated from his brothers and put in a position that he was his dad's favorite child. And so, again, rivalries are coming about. Not only that, but he's hanging out one day with uh, his brothers. And they say Billa and Zippa. So these aren't Rachel and Leah. These are the handmaid's um, uh, children. So Billa actually gave birth to Dan and Naphtali and um, Zilpah's Gad and Asher. So he's hanging out with kind of like the, the half-brothers 
um, step or half brothers and they're hanging out and doesn't say that his father told him to bring this report or if he did it on his own. So Joseph already is kind of getting that. He's just getting that stigma of being the, the bratty brother, the little brother. It's always telling on you. You know, we, 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 oh, here comes Joseph. You know, let's hide over here and do this. Let's do that. Because every time he comes around, oh, dad, oh, I'm going to tell dad on you. I'm going to go tell dad. That's what he's that's what Joseph is. Again, he's 17 years old. And if you could put your mind, I know Sarah's 16, but if you could put your mind at a 17 year old when you were 17 years old, you are not fully mature. So this guy is bringing himself to maturity, or they're trying to bring him to maturity, but again, you still, he's, he's still young, he's still underdeveloped, and God is, is going to use Joseph in a way that is going to uh, deliver his brothers. And one thing before I get way too ahead of myself, because so, the story is so exciting, I want to stop right here, because we're going to talk about detours. And when you talk about a detour... It's not a straight line. It, 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 it tends to go this way, or you may have to go back and then come back around. So what I want to do is I want to jump forward to show you the destination, and then we're going to take the detour right to it. So real quickly, in chapter 45, 7, and 8, I want to read, because I want us to lock in here, because God is doing something in, in, behind the scenes to take Joseph to a specific location, but we don't know why and we don't understand why it's happening that way. Chapter 45, verse 7, and it says, and this is Joseph speaking to his brothers, um, and God sent me before you preserve a, a posterity for you in the earth, or a remnant, uh, and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you who sent me here, but God, and he has made, and we'll just stop right there, but God. So just that part. So now it was not you who sent me here, but God. So God has sent already. We, we fast forward. Joseph is in a location, in a position that he says that God had sent him there. So we're going to watch this thing unravel and, and, and see how God had put him in that position. Because it's not going to look like it, it. God had his hand in this at all as we go through this. So again, Joseph being the, the, the tattletale, hey, dad, look at these. My brothers are doing this. And, you know, now he's got this coat. You know, and it, you know when you buy something new and it's your favorite thing, you wear it all the time. If it's a jacket or a nice pair of pants or shoes, you're wearing that thing all the time, just sporting it. And so every time Joseph comes around, that's what they see. They see that coat and they're reminded like, oh, man, here comes this guy again, you know. And so there's already animosity between the brothers. And to make matters worse, uh, Joseph's about to open his, his immature mouth and, and make things a whole lot uh, just worse for him. And he has these dreams, which he probably should have kept to himself, but he didn't. And so he goes and he rushes to his brothers. Verse five. Now, Joseph. And this is back to thirty seven. Now Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. So he said to them, Please, hear this dream which I've dreamed. There, were, there we were, binding sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheaf rose and also stood upright. And indeed, your sheaves stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. And the brothers said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams, for his words. So they already hated this kid. Now it's just like they can't stand this kid. It's like, man, this guy is just on something else. He, he's already taken the position of the firstborn. Now he's telling us he's having these dreams uh, that he's going to rule over us. Verse 9, Then he dreamed still another dream and told his brothers and said, Look, I have dreamed another dream, and this time the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars bowed down to me. So he told it to his father and his brothers, and his father rebuked him and said to him, what is this dream that you've dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in his mind. Because remember, Joseph, or Jacob also had some dreams previously uh, whenever he went to Bethel and he dreamed that he's seen angels descending on a ladder. And then he also had another dream when uh, his situation with Laban, his, his father-in-law, about the flocks, and they, he had a, the vision of the, the bigger uh, goats with the streaks, uh, which we didn't really get into that, but he, he knew about visions. He knew about dreams, and for his youngest son, his favorite son, from his favorite wife to tell him that, 
He was angered, but he's like, man, there may be something to this, because I, I used to have dreams. And again, remember, there's a theology here that's unspoken. We're, we're going from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and now this is about to carry on. So obviously, Abraham spoke to Isaac, and they had their experience, Isaac to Jacob, and they were carrying on a theology. These stories were going down the line of, you know, this is my experience with God, this is what he promised. And so there is a theology here that's unspoken, and we're going to unravel that as we go through. So again, now Joseph is hated by his brothers, and they can't stand this kid. He's the bratty kid. He's the tattletale. He just all of a sudden, he's the favorite. Uh, they've been working for years and, and hanging out. And so things are about to take a turn. Then his brothers, verse 12, went to feed their flock in Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, are not your brothers feeding the flock in Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. So he said to him, here I am. Then he said, go. He said to him, please go and see if it is well with your brothers and well with the flocks and bring the word to me. So he sent him out of the valley, Hebron, and he went to Shechem. Now a certain man found him there. Uh, he was wandering in the field, and the man asked him, What are you seeking? So he said, I'm seeking my brothers. Please tell me where, I, where they are feeding the flocks. And the man said, Oh, they, oh, they have departed from here, for I heard them say, Let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found him in Dothan. Now when, this, when they saw him afar off, even before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. Then they said to one another, Look, this dreamer is coming. Come, therefore, let us now kill him and cast him into some pit, and we shall say to him, say, we shall say some wild beasts had devoured him. We shall see what will become of his dreams. So again, here comes just to paint the scene here. Jacob is sending Joseph to a destination already. Go to Shechem. Go where your brothers are at. Go check on them. Bring back word. Are they good? How are the flocks? Do they need anything? So he goes. And in Joseph's head, his destination is wherever his brothers are at. So already that first detour came about. He's going to Shechem. That's his destination. They're not there. Guy's like, what are you looking for? My brothers, the flocks. Oh, I heard him talking about Dothan. They're probably, they're probably over there. Go. So that's, that's the first detour. Now he's going to Dothan. Dothan is set up, and it's, uh, I want to say it's 15 miles north of Shechem. So he, he did some, some walking or traveling. I don't know how he got there, but he, he, was, he was traveling. So he gets there. Dothan is set up, and it's actually on um, a trade route going to Egypt. So things are kind of falling into place. God's working in the background. And so he finally goes, and he's, he's coming to Dothan. They see the brothers, and the brothers see someone far off. And, and again... Just like I said, when you have a favorite something that you like, you wear it all the time. So they probably didn't know it was Joseph, but they seen that colored coat like, oh, this guy. Here we go. This dreamer. And, and, and so they begin to conspire. Remember, Simeon and Levi have already murdered before. And not only them, but other brothers, too. So there's they're a group of murderers here. They're brothers. They've murdered. They're killers. Here comes this guy. He's in our way. He's already took the firstborn position without him. In the way, we could probably move up a little better. Life would be great. Nobody's telling on us. Let's kill this dude. Let's, let's kill him. And so they devise a plan. Yeah, when he gets closer, we're going to get a hold of him. We're going to kill this guy. And then we'll, we'll regain our, our claim and what's ours. Verse 21. But Reuben heard it and delivered him out of their hands and said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, but cast him into the, this pit which is in the wilderness, and do not lay a hand on him, that he might deliver him out of their hands and bring them back to his father. So it came to pass, when Joseph had come to his brothers, they had stripped Joseph of his tunic, the tunic of many colors, that was on him. They took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty, and there was no water in it. And they sat down to eat a meal. So let, let's rewind that and go back over that. Remember, Reuben was the firstborn, and Reuben's trying to intercede now. Maybe he's trying to get back in good graces with his father. They, he hears his brothers conspiring to kill the youngest brother. He's like, no, 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 no. Let's not do that. Let's do something else. We don't have to take this kid's life. Let's, uh, let's shed no blood, but cast him into a pit. So the word pit uh, is in Hebrew is bor, which means pit, well, or cistern. 
So this is actually going to be a cistern. So they find a hole in the ground. It's probably no bigger, probably no bigger than this. Maybe a little bit bigger than that. And this hole in the ground is going to go, a cistern is about 30 feet deep. And this is where they would have the water, collect water uh, for their livestock or vegetation or for their own personal use. So they find this cistern, they remove the mouth of it, and again, it's not that big of a, a hole, and they throw their brother down into this hole. And it says there's no water in it. So this thing is dry. But before they do that, they strip Joseph of his tunic. And so let's, let's think about that. Because sometimes the people we love can put us in a pit. Sometimes the people who we trusted can turn their back on us and put us in a, in a dark spot. And before that happens, and God's there watching the whole time, sometimes we got to be stripped of things we love, stripped of things that we may identify with, that we cover ourselves in, and that's taken away. He identified with that coat. He wore it all the time. He was, he, his brothers seen him when they were coming up. Oh, there's that dreamer. I could tell by the coat. I could tell. They see it. They strip him of it. God does that to us many a times before a transition occurs. Sometimes he will cut off the provisions to bring you to a next level, or he will strip you of what you think who you are to really show you who you are. You may think, well, I'm this, and I, you know, I'm feeling myself, and I'm smelling good, and I got money. And God's like, you think so? Let me take that from you real quick. And he will take that from you. And you may identify with that and you may, this is who I am. This, I'm, I am, you know, my work or I am whatever it is that you think is important. God will strip it and then put you in a position where now you're, you're in a dark spot. And it may not be the, your actions that got you there, but the people around you. And you're in a position where you're just in a dry spot. And that's what we go through sometimes. We, there, in this journey, in this Christian experience, we're going to reach some dry spots in, our, in our, our lives, in our journey. And Joseph is definitely in a dry spot. Not only that, but when you're in a hole like that, just all closed in, and you're screaming and you're yelling and nobody's answering, hopelessness sets in. And so you're like, how am I going to get out of here? God, where are you at? I thought you were with me. I, you know, I, I was, I got the coat. I'm my favorite, my mom dad's favorite. You know, I was doing, I was watching over things, bringing good reports. Where you at, God? Mercy. Thought you were with me. Mercy. I thought we had something. I thought there was, I thought you were real. But now he's in that dry, dry spot, in that hole. Verse 25 says, and they sat down to eat a meal. His brothers are chilling. They got rid of Joseph, and now they're, hey, let's start a fire, man. I'm hungry. All that wrestling and getting this kid in the hole. Let's, see, let's get something to eat. And that is just so cold-blooded when I think about that. I mean, you got your youngest brother. You hate him so much. I mean, you can't stand him. And it says that, that, that there was no peace. That they, they, It's like they had no peace when this kid was around. That's, that's just basically saying, I cannot stand you. When you are around, when you're in the room, I just don't want to look at you. I, I can't stand you. So they had that, that emotion towards him and did what they did. And they began to eat a meal as if none of this happened. And maybe they were eating a meal and thinking, all right, what's our next move? What are we going to do now? I don't know. What, what do you think, Asher? I don't know. Well, it's kind of too late to go back now because if we go get him out of the hole, he's going to go tell dad. And dad's going to do something to us. So now we're in a spot. You know, what, what do we do? The next part of that verse says, Then they lifted their eyes and looked, and there was company of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing spices, balm, and myrrh, and on their way to carry them down to Egypt. See, God is working. We haven't heard anything about God yet, but again, God's about to use this detour from Shechem to Dothan on a trade route to get Joseph where he needs to be. Remember, we started the story. God put me in this position. So now we're about to see how, because right now it doesn't look like God's even here. I mean, his brothers are doing things to him, being evil and, and wanting to kill him. But they look up and they see these 
band of travelers and they already know oh yeah the, we know what's going on they they're they're traveling they're about to go trade the spices and do, do these things and so he says verse 26 so judah said to his brothers what profit is there if we kill our brother and conceal his blood come let us sell him to the ishmaelites and let not our hand be upon him for he is our brother and our flesh so i want to take a note right there that notice it was judah who interceded for joseph because that'll come up later um, in, in prophecy, how Judah is the, the one to intercede. Continue one on. Um, 28. The Midianite traders passed by, so the brothers pulled Joseph and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver, and they took Joseph to Egypt. Now, right there I want to pause because in verse 42, 21, it gives us a little bit more insight of exactly what was being said and done. So verse 42, 21. You don't have to turn there if you don't want to, but this is going to color in the picture a little bit. And this is Reuben speaking. He says, Then they said to one another, We are truly guilty concerning our brother, for we saw the anguish of his soul when he pleaded with us, and we would not hear. Therefore the distress has come upon us. So, just a little insight. Joseph was screaming, crying, mourning to his brothers, looking at him in their eye, Please don't do this to me. Stop. You know, but they didn't care. They, their hearts were already stoned. They were cold. They already had a mission. Let's get rid of this dude. We can't let him live. We can't let him get back to the house because if he tells dad, we're all done. We're murderers already. Dad already hates and not hates us, but he, we, we're not in good um, standing with dad. So we got to do something. Judah's like, hey, let's not kill this kid. Let's just get rid of him. We don't know where they're going. They're, let's just trade them off. We know they're going to Egypt. So this is going to be off our hands. No more headache. Let's do this. 29, then Reuben returned to the pit, because I don't know where Reuben went while this was happening, but he came back. Indeed, Joseph was not in the pit, and he tore his clothes and returned to his brothers and said, the lad is no more, and I, where shall I go? Remember, Reuben's already knocked out of the first position of the firstborn. He's trying to intercede. Now he's in bigger trouble because now his father's favorite son, when they all come back, what are we going to say about Joseph? And Reuben, again, firstborn, he's, you know, the pressure's on. So they took Joseph's tunic, killed a kid of the goats, and dipped the tunic in the blood. Then they sent the tunic of many colors, and they brought it to their father and said, We have found this. Do you know whether it is your son's tunic or not? Now, isn't that a little ironic that when Jacob tried to fool his dad, he used goat skin? Now all of Jacob's children are trying to fool their dad with the goat's blood to cover it and say that he was dead. And he recognized it and he said, My son's tunic, a wild beast has devoured him. Without doubt, Joseph is torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put sackcloth on his waist, and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and all his daughters arose to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, for I shall go down in the grave to my son in the morn in mourning. Thus his father wept for him. Depression had set in for Jacob. So much so that he couldn't even be relieved from his family, his daughter. And this affects the whole family. When, when, especially if the father or the mother of the family is depressed and they're the backbone of that family, it's really hard sometimes because you see that strong person in your life and they, you just you can't get them to get that that hope again that that joy they once had so jacob is is falling into a deep depression verse 36 now the midianites had sold him in egypt to potiphar an officer of pharaoh and a captain of the guard joseph made it to egypt again verse 42 21 or 45 7 and 8 because we're about to bring this to a close God sent me before you to preserve a, a remnant for you in the earth and to save your lives by great deliverance so now it was not you who sent me here but God so in their mind in their eyes man we messed up man they we, we gotta we gotta pretend like he's dead let's kill this goat let's go tell dad in their minds, in their eyes, they sent Joseph out that way. But when Joseph looks at the story, he says, So now it was not you who sent me here, but God. 
God has a way of making a detour fit for His purpose. If we acknowledge Him in all our ways, He will direct our paths. That's what Scripture says, because sometimes we feel lost. Sometimes we have those pit moments. God, where are you at? How am I getting out of here? I'm hopeless, but God is working something. Because why He's got you here in this hole? He's working something over here in Egypt. Because He sees something down the line in history that's coming. And if He doesn't save this remnant, then that line of Judah, that, that, that seed that he talked about in Genesis, is not going to come to fruition. So he's got to preserve this family so that Christ can finally come through to fulfill the, the will of the Father so that we can be here into this building today talking about this story. This thing all had a plan. And a lot of times we don't see that. We are in pit moments and we are in confusion the people we love turned our back on us sometimes or they, we feel like it has or you feel like you're being ostracized. You're being pushed out of something and you're like, where are you at, God? Why? What did I do? How did this happen to me? I thought I was you know, riding high. I was a favorite. I was going to take over and do things. That was Joseph's way of thinking. God had other plans for Joseph. And so now we're seeing all these things kind of come together. And, and before we go any further, I want to give a definition of just the word detour, and then we'll, we'll go ahead and wrap this up. Detour, the definition is a way of getting to a place that is indirect and longer than usual way and which is taken in order to avoid a particular problem or to do something special. And what does that mean to do something special? It's just like if after church, I was like, hey, well, let's, let's go visit the museum. But hey, let's take a detour because I want to show you guys something special. I want you to experience something before we hit that museum. That, that's that little something special. You have to experience something a little different before you get to the destination. So God is taking Joseph on a detour because he's trying to get him somewhere geographically so he can position him for something greater. Right now, God may be taking you on a detour and you may feel lost and you don't know why these things are happening. And you're wondering, why does it keep happening to me? Why am I being ostracized? Why do I feel this way? I've been following you, God. I've been reading my Bible. But why are these people hating on me? God's like, you don't, you, you're not understanding. You're not seeing. There's a bigger plan here. Just like we read in the Psalms, you know, uh, lean not onto your own understanding, but acknowledge me in all your ways. And I'll direct your paths. So he ha he's, God is cooking something up for Joseph, and we're going to get into that, Lord willing, next week when we talk about how God got him from Hebron, Hebron to Egypt. So now he's, he's moved position from Hebron to Egypt, and he's about to use him for a greater experience. I want to 